15. Thank you so much, Mike and the worship team. Great reminder for us that we serve God and we worship a God who is unchangeable, who is unstoppable. There is nothing in this world, there is nothing that can happen in our lives, in the life of this nation, and in this world that will stop what God is doing. And uh, that's the confidence that we have, that we are not, that the gospel ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is not defined by polling data or who wins the elections or how many people show up at Chick-fil-A or do not show up at Chick-fil-A. God is going to accomplish His work through us. And I uh, think the sooner we realize that as believers, I think the sooner we can be about just continuing the work that He's is given us. I was kidding earlier. I was not kidding, but I was. You do pray for for Mike and pray for me too. Uh, our daughters are getting married, not to each other, but separate. <laughs> Melissa is getting married here in San Angelo, and our daughter Rachel is getting married in Portales, New Mexico. Uh, Michael was telling me one time, Kim is from Clovis, New Mexico, and Cammy, Michael's wife, is from our teaching in New, New Mexico. And, and Michael said, Dad, we did it right. We married these New Mexicans and brought them to Texas as quickly as we could. <laughs> and Rachel is doing it wrong because they're going to live in Portales. Well, they're going to finish school, and, but we'll see what the Lord does. I was just reminded, Mike, as uh, I was talking, I thought about a lot about what uh, we're doing. This, this is the second, Mike's and Ke uh, uh, Becky's second daughter, their younger daughter, so it's their baby who's getting married. And when Mike and, and Josh got married, and Josh just got married uh, five weeks ago, and I was, I mean, it was fine, it was, it was great. And I thought, well, it'll be fine for Rachel also. I'll be honest. I'll be honest, Mike. I've had a hard time this past week. And I don't know how this next week is going to be. And it just reminded me of something that I heard Dr. Swindoll say one time. He went to a wedding of a friend of his whose daughter got married. Uh, and during the reception, Dr. Swindoll approached his friend who was standing by himself looking really sad and he said uh, are you okay and he said now I know how it feels to hand a Stradivarius violent a gorilla <laughs> I missed a lot of you Stradivarius violin is, is the most expensive type of violin and you don't let anyone handle that and so there's a sense uh, I know Becky and Mike appreciate the uh, uh, their future son-in-law and Kim and I appreciate uh, Paul. Uh, there's just it's just hard when you when when it's your it's your daughter. But anyway, it'll be a fun time. But there's also a mix of that those emotions. And really, that's kind of like what we see here in the text we're about to read this morning. There are three sections and there are three different things that we're going to be looking at from from chapter 15, beginning in verse 36, through chapter 16, verse 10. Uh, when we go through some tough times, uh, I'm sorry, when we go through some really neat times, like weddings are fun. Uh, I know there are a lot of work, but it's a great celebration. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Uh, people like people who have no desire to be part of the church won't come to church, won't do anything with the church, and yet if they think about getting married, they may want to get married to church. There's something that they respect and admire about the, the, the marriage and the wedding that is, that, that is done in the church. And, and so it's, it's a lot of fun, but in Mike's in my case, for this coming weekend, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of celebration and all of that, but there's also a sense of difficulty that, that we have as, as dads uh, to let go. What we see here, in, in the text that we're about to look at is the exciting things that happened that God allowed uh, Paul and Barnabas and the rest of their missionary team from Antioch what God allowed them to do and then there were some problems and we'll, we'll look into it but let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for, his, for Him to teach us this morning
Father, we, we, we just ask for your grace this morning. Father, that you will teach us, that you will open our hearts. That, Father, as we look at the, how you preserve this, this history of the church, that we will not just look at it as the history of the church, but, Father, that your work continues on in our lives and in the lives of our church and the lives of your, your church, the universal church. And that, Father, that you work your purpose out through imperfect vehicles like we are, like they were at the time. And we thank you for that. We thank you that what we've been seeing through your word, especially in the book of Acts, is finding the sovereign work that you do as you reach out to the nations, as you redeem people, and as you establish your church. And help us see that, Father, and help us also get that sense of purpose, that single-minded understanding that we, Father, you didn't redeem us just so we can just have a good life in this, in this, in San Angelo, wherever we live. But Father, you want to use us, proclaim to people through our lives and with our mouths the wonderful, wonderful, incredible, surprisingly incredible good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and their salvation to Him. In His name we pray. Amen. Let's look at the text, beginning in verse 36. Remember what had happened? They had gone to Jerusalem to make sure that what was going on with the Gentiles was going to be resolved. And you remember last week when there was a, uh, they decided, uh, the council in Jerusalem decided that they were not going to impose on the Gentiles anything other than that people are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. You don't have to do anything. Uh, beggars cannot do anything. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot work for it. You cannot um, be religious enough to be saved. You simply understand. As you understand the holiness of God, you understand then you see your sinfulness and you cry out to God and you accept by faith what Christ has already done for you. I mean, that's really the simple truth. But there was a letter that was sent from, uh, from the church basically affirming that, that the gospel, that salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. But you remember that they had some areas of uh, sensitivity, cultural sensitivity, to that they, they wanted the Gentiles to make sure that they're not offending the Jewish brothers or their brothers of Jewish background. And, but it was an exciting thing, and so they went back to Antioch. And they uh, uh, gave a report of what had happened. And verse 36, it says, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. By the way, this is a normal part of the gospel ministry and of the disciple-making process. Uh, Ralph White of the uh, U.S. Center for World Missions said years ago that a lot of churches are involved in, in missions, but a lot of churches are involved in what he called drive-by missions, where we go to one place, we have vacation Bible school, or we would build a house or something, and, and that's fine for a week or two weeks. We take pictures, we come back to our churches, we show a slide uh, of that trip, and we, we tell people how great it was, God saved some people, uh, and then we leave, and then I will never return. I had a friend in town who told me that he said, "Man, look you got to be. You, this is really exciting. I know you, you love missions, and, and this is an exciting thing. A church is sending two teams in this very difficult area where there's in, in a large city in, in East Asia, and uh, he he said uh, we're we're just doing, we're handing out Bibles and, and sharing Christ in coffee shops and places like that. And I said, "Who are you working with?" And uh, he said. Nobody. I said, what do you mean you're not working with anybody? I said, so what happens if you now have believers in those places? If people come to know Christ, who is going to disciple them? And he didn't have an answer for me. But the heart of the gospel ministry is not just to make converts. Remember Matthew 28, when Jesus was about to ascend to heaven. He didn't say, as you are going, make converts of all nations. He says, as you are going... 
Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, immersing them in the person and works of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That is the work that we have to do, and this is the heart that Paul had. He wanted to go back. Him and I have been to places. I think a lot of this morning, I was going for my walk, and I thought about, and the Lord reminded me of a place where we had served in the northeastern part of Brazil, and it's been a long time, but there were some people that we ministered to there and, and ministered with, and, and there was a church that was meeting in, in an open, it's, it's just an open lot. There was no, no facilities or anything like that, which is, by the way, very common in a lot of places in the world. And I thought about Nova Alianza, where, where the pastor, where the pastor's wife tried to Kim, Kim gave her, her her guitar at the time, and, and she wanted to, pay, to reciprocate, and she removed her wedding ring and tried to give it to Kim, and Kim said, well, I can't take the wedding ring. But you know, there's a part of me that still, there's part of my heart that still wants to see what's going on with those people, those believers, and that's been 20, 26, 27 years ago. And, and that is why in our church we, we do and what we, could, we want to continue to do long-term partnerships in missions because we've got to, to, to work with people and to walk with them so that people then are growing in their faith. This is what Paul wanted to do. Sometime later Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also Paul Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. We don't know. The text does not tell us in the book of Acts. Luke does not tell us why he left. We, there are some guesses that you can have. Well, one thing we know is he left. He was no longer part of the team. Uh, in verse 39 it says they had such a sharp disagreement. The sharp disagreement is not like they, they were just kind of disagreeing Maybe, you know, you see you see it one way and I see it another way. The word for sharp disagreement here has the word, we actually we have an English word that, that means, that is taken exactly from the Greek. It's just a transliteration from the Greek. And it means a violent emotion. Not that they came into blows. But it, this is a very strong emotion. They were not only seeing, seeing eye to eye. They just had no, had no common ground in terms of taking John Mark. The issue was John Mark. Should we take John Mark with us or not? Barnabas, who was his cousin, according to Paul in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, wanted to take him. But of course we understand the personality and, and the kind of ministry that, that Barnabas had. Barnabas, according to the book of Acts, was one of those encouragers. In fact, that's what his name means, son of encouragement. And so he always wanted to, to encourage people. He was the one, when Paul first went and fled from Damascus after his conversion, he was preaching in Damascus, and fled to Jerusalem. Well, the, the apostles were, and the disciples, the followers of Christ were afraid of him, of Paul, because this is the same guy who was persecuting the church. Guess who came alongside Saul at the time, who became Paul later on? It was Barnabas, who then said, told him what happened to Paul, and introduced him to the brothers. And so he was the one who went with him and introduced him to people. Not only that, when, when, when the church began to spread, as the Holy Spirit spread the church from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then it started going up north through the, 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 the towns in, you have that map there, uh, through the towns headed up north and all the way to Antioch. There is Antioch right there, and it became, Antioch was again the first multicultural church, and they heard what was going on, and so they sent, what did they send into Antioch? They sent Barnabas to check it out. Barnabas was working, he's probably teaching so many Bible studies during the, the week, it was almost every single day, and so he said, well, I can't do this on my own. So what does he do? He looked for Paul, who was from Tarsus. He was ministering in Tarsus, so he went, he goes to Tarsus, gets Paul, and brings him back to Antioch. And the two of them began pastoring this church in Antioch. Well, they, they realized immediately that the ministry of the gospel is not like, okay, we're, we're having a great time here in our church, we have... Bible studies, people are coming to the Bible studies, we have fellowships, we have outreach, and people are coming, people are calling, they like our websites, and all of that. It's not just that. But they understood what the work of the gospel was, which is not just about us here, but it's got to go beyond the walls of our church. And so what did they do? They established a mission team. And so they went on this first missionary journey, and we saw that in the last few weeks. And they went, so this is, they had come back. So during that time, there was this bonding of these two men. And these two men were probably two very different men. When you read the, the, the letters of Paul, 
you see, you sense this heart of this apostle who was very simple-minded, very focused, didn't matter what was going on in his life. Philippians, he talks about, hey, he said, it doesn't matter if I'm in jail. He said, if this is advancing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 12, verse 10. He said, if this is advancing the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, this is great. And he saw his imprisonment as part of the word for advance there is it's a military term in the Greek and it means it's, it's kind of like sending your engineers to either pave the roads, pave the way, or build a bridge so that then the army can cross. And he said, my imprisonment, he saw the struggles that he had personally and in ministry as a way for God to advance the gospel. That's how he saw everything he did. He said, we, in, in, to the church in Corinth, he said, I, I didn't come with, we, we didn't come with, with, with excellency of speech or eloquence of speech, but we simply came preaching the gospel, preaching Christ crucified. I think if you call Paul the gospel, he would believe the gospel. But Barnabas' his ministry was a little bit different. He was still part of that. But they made such a great team. Because what Paul lacked probably in, in terms of, okay, S -S -S Mrs. Smith is sick. Well, let's run over there and say hi to her, pray with her, and then let's go. Let's go proclaim the gospel. And Barnabas wants to hang around and minister to her. And so both of them the two of them, having those two hearts, two different hearts, how the Holy Spirit has gifted them, they were very, very effective in that ministry. But those two men had a disagreement. It's not about the gospel, but it's about the methodology of it. John Mark, who was Barnabas' cousin, left him, and Barnabas wanted to take him again on his second missionary journey, and Paul said, no way. He bailed out, bailed out on us, you can take it if you want to, but I'm not going to take it. He's not going to be. He's going to. He's not going to be doing that again. Now, look at what happened. Verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, John Mark, and sailed for Cyprus. By the way, John Mark. Uh, Barnabas is from the island of Cyprus. Uh, John Mark is from this area in in. in uh, well, he was from this church, and they were cousins, and, and so Cyprus is not that far from, from, uh, from Antioch. So he took John Mark and sailed for Cyprus, close to home, not too far. You know, just want just to go to Mertzen, and you know, that's where they're going to do ministry, in Mertzen, or in Water Valley. But Paul chose Silas. Now, who was Silas? Silas was one of the brothers that came from Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, as they sent the letter out. And he said he chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And then he went through Syria, which is this whole area here, and Cilicia. They began to minister in this area where Paul is from. Okay? Now, I want you to see something here. I want you to notice several things. Now, before I say this, it is always, it is always important to highlight this in Bible interpretation. You do not make, generally you do not make a big point of something that is not in the scriptures, like if, if there's an absence of something. But I want to point, point something out to you here. In the text that we just read, chapter 15, there is an absence of a rebuke from the Holy Spirit or from God for either Paul or Barnabas. But what God was doing was He allowed the disagreement between the two of them to cause them to expand the ministry instead of one team, one missionary team. Now they had two missionary teams, one Barnabas and John Mark went to Cyprus, and the other one was Paul and Silas, and they headed north towards the rest of Syria and Cilicia. Uh, now you might say, well, was that was one better than the other? Uh, not, not really. Although Luke begins to follow from here on, not the ministry of Barnabas, but the ministry of Paul. But we also find from the rest of the epistles, from the rest of the letters, what God had done. And I, don't, I don't know what Barnabas did. Barnabas probably in this way ministered to, to his cousin. Probably let him know that what he did was wrong. And encouraged him. And spurred him on to walk with the Lord. And this is one thing we find in the scriptures about John Mark. Well, the gospel of Mark 
was written by no other than this young man, John Mark. We also find John Mark with Paul when he was writing to the church in Colossae. And he mentions that. And then get this, in, 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 in Paul's last known letter to the church in, uh, I mean not to the church, but to, to Timothy, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was written probably right before he was beheaded. And, you know, you, you get to be old and you've been in the ministry for a while and you've been in prison several times, you've been shipwrecked, as he said, and been beaten, he's been stoned, all kinds of things, and he experienced just the wonder of, of doing ministry for the Lord, and, and he's probably looking back and probably chilling in, in, in his cell, and I know if it's the same cell that, that we had seen in, in Rome, uh, it's, it's probably also stunk, uh, because it's close to the sewer of, of the, the forum, where the forum was and is. And, and he was there, and he was probably a little bit wistful about his ministry. And he said, guys, would you bring me my scrolls, my books that I left? And said, bring my, my jacket, bring my cloak also. And said, and would you also, tell Timothy, would you also come quickly and bring John Mark with you? For his ministry is important to me. So at the end of Paul's ministry, at the end of all his life, he was longing for one of those young men that here in Acts 15, we see them separate ways because of this young man. And that's what God does, by the way. That's what God does, doesn't He? He can not only men, not only does He men relationships, but He multiplies the ministry that we do in spite of the kind of people that we are. One thing that has always amazed me and I think, I don't know if it's pride, I'm sure it's probably partly pride, and probably lack of understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Is I would hear from time to time, people would say, I hope this guy was a non-Christian, but it's very eloquent, or a good singer, or very popular. So I hope he gets saved, well, I hope she gets saved. Because he, if he or she gets saved, because he's popular, or he's very eloquent, and he's a famous basketball player, or a football player, or a soccer player, whatever, or baseball player, then he can win a lot of people to the Lord. It, it is, guys, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and he uses ordinary people like you and me, just as he did with them. And I've thought about this a lot when I read, when I think about the scriptures. I mean, like, the privilege that I have and some of us who get to stand up in front of you either in Sunday school or small group or, or preach in here at church or in other churches to be able to do this. So think about this. And like Paul, let me say this, it's not with eloquence of speech. I know some of you still make fun of me because there's, like I can, I struggle with my THs. You know, I still want to three. Uh, and you all make fun of some of my accent. But have you ever thought about that God can use anybody to speak His Word? If He so chooses? If He could use, I've thought about this before, if He could use a donkey, He could use any one of us. And so it's not with, because I have certain skills, I have nothing to offer the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't either, but we, by grace, are used to the Lord of faith. And then He brings this wonderful fruit and ministry he does through us, through all of our imperfections and through all of the messes that we make. And that's not by the way being lazy. I understand Ezra chapter 7. The hand of the Lord was upon Ezra because he committed himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to its teaching to all Israel. I understand that. But all I'm saying is we should never think that it's because of our skills or our looks. The certain don't have the looks, but our skills or eloquence or whatever it is that are our abilities that, that we can advance in God's No. It is the work of God through us. It is through us. Now, we mentioned a guy here named Silas. Now, who was Silas? Again, I said, I mentioned that he's one of the guys from Jerusalem. He was also a Roman citizen. Because when they were arrested later on, look at uh, chapter 16, verse 37. Paul said to the officers, because they were arrested and, and they were beaten, 
is that they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens. He's talking about himself and, and, and uh, Silas. We also know from chapter 15 that he was a prophet. And we also know that uh, he probably helped Paul in writing some of his letters. Uh, in the same way that he helped First Peter, I mean, uh, P Peter in First Peter 5.12, it says this, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Here's an interesting thing. Barnabas was a great loss to the team and the ministry of Paul. But Silas was a great name. And God allowed, through the problems, the disagreements that they had, for the two teams to expand, for the ministry to expand, and for the gospel to go forth. 16, 1 through 5. Well, he's following Luke. He's now following the ministry of Paul. So he, meaning Paul, came to Derby. Uh, Derby is in this area here uh, where they had been before in the area of Phrygia and Galatia. Uh, he came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. Remember, they were there. In fact, that's where he was stoned. And probably met this guy, Timothy, when uh, he went there the first time. A young man, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The brothers of Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area. For all They all knew that his father was a Greek. There is a... There is a, uh, a written, a rabbinic, some rabbinic writings that, that call for a, a, a child, a son of mixed marriage like this, uh, for the child to be, for the son to be circumcised, to follow that, or else he would be, uh, he would be breaking the law. And, and Paul wanted to take him along the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area, for they all knew that his father was Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. Now let me just say this. When the Jerusalem church said that avoid sexual immorality, uh, do not eat food or things that have been sacrificed to idols and, or the issue of blood with the animals that they're eating or the food that they're eating, that was not in addition, it was not like a gospel plus you are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, by, in Christ alone, and then you've got to do these things. No, it was a, a cultural sensitive issue for the Jewish brothers. And so that's all that they were saying. And here it is the same way. Paul circumcised Timothy because not because it is necessary for him to be a follower of Jesus Christ, for him to be circumcised so he could be a follower of Christ. No. Salvation for Timothy was the same as for anyone else. Saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. But, because of that cultural sensitivity, remember still this time, Paul, in every town that he went to, he would go to the synagogues. Well, I guess who were in the synagogues? Jews. And they would listen to him. He didn't want that to be an issue. That here is a son of a Jewish mother and a Greek father. And he's not circumcised. So he just went ahead and removed that, that contention, that, that possible source of contention. And he just said, I'll go ahead and circumcise you. By the way, this is interesting. He did not have Titus, who was also one of his disciples, circumcised. Because Titus was Greek. He had a father and a mother who, who were Greek. And he's, he was not Jewish. And so the, the issue here that he's talking about is, is the issue of... Making sure that there is nothing that hinders the proclamation of the gospel. In fact, in his letter to the church in Corinth, he said this. He said, we put up 1 Corinthians 9, 12. I think I have it there on, on, on the screen. Are you all awake over there? <laughs> Just wanting to make sure. Uh, not, no, not that one, it's from Scripture. 1 Corinthians 9, 12, it says, We put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then later on in the same chapter, he says, As though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win. Would you go to the next text, uh, John? Uh, 
Although I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have done all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Years ago, by the way, when we moved, when we moved from, from uh, Border to San Angelo, one, one of the things immediately that I noticed, people here are a lot more casual in their attire. And I remember our pastors, our staff in First Baptist Border, they would always be wearing uh, at least a tie or at least a, a long sleeve shirt, even during the week. And, and nice slacks and, and all of that, except for the youth minister. Youth minister is always weird. Um, <laughs> but when we moved here, I noticed a lot of the pastors that I knew that I met, because I was meeting with some pastors at the time, I was just hanging out with them, um, and I noticed they were very casual. And so I learned how to just dress a little bit more casual. I still felt uncomfortable wearing jeans during the week. Uh, now I wear jeans a lot more. But I would just wear like khakis and, and just a knit shirt. And I remember there was an older pastor who retired and moved to San Angelo. And when he went to visit the hospital, he and I have been friends for 20, 24 years. And, and when he'd go visit, when I'd see him at the hospital, he was always wearing a suit. And, and that's great, that's fine. He looks great in a suit. But I remember taking him aside one day at the community hospital and he said, you know, it, it just amazes me that you'll come visit people at the hospital and not wear a suit and a tie. And I just said, you know what, Roy? If I showed up in a suit and a tie at the hospital, they'll probably think I'm about to do their funeral. And so I don't dare do that. Because people here, I don't know if you've noticed it, it's, People are more casual here. Another issue that I know I've seen in Southern Philippines, some of our frontliners, the guys we work with, these are believers now. And they have every freedom. They have every freedom to eat whatever they want to. But they still, because they live in Muslim areas in Southern Philippines, they will not eat pork even away from their, their hometowns. We can have some of the best pork chops, or we would offer them pork chops and they would not eat them because they don't even want to get into the habit of eating something that is offensive to their neighbors whom they're going to be sharing Christ with. And they, don't, they want to have the integrity and to be honest with them, to be able to say, I have never eaten pork. And so to this day, they don't eat pork. Some of the guys that we work with and by the way, this is the same thing that we, we see here. Paul handles that, deals with that issue, like in 1 Corinthians, in, in chapters, really chapters 9, 8, 9, 10, and, and 11, about some of those issues, those cultural issues. Uh, he deals about, for instance, food sacrifice to idols. He, he says, you know, food sacrifice to idols, I mean, that, that's fine if, 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 you know, it doesn't do anything to you. Uh, in terms of, if you, if you have a clear conscience about it, you have every freedom to buy... Uh, grade A beef from, from them, you can eat it, but don't flaunt it by eating at the marketplace where other people can see you. Or if you've been invited to somebody's home and they make an issue of that, then don't even touch it. See, what is important is not the freedoms and the liberties that we have in Christ that you can, you might think, well, I can drink a little bit of wine because there's nothing in the scripture that says that. If you offend a brother or a sister, or if you'll cause some people to think ill of the gospel or to question you, then we need to think twice about it. And that is the cultural sensitivity that he addresses here. Look at what happened, the result of what they were doing, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. By the way, 
there are a lot of cultural issues that we face in San Angelo, uh, in, in West Texas. And always just remember that, that the paramount concern that we must have is not so much what it is that we like or the freedoms that we have, but whether by our lives, the decisions that we make, especially in public, in terms of these cultural issues, would either hinder or advance the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at verse, beginning verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Asia, by the way, is not like what we think of Asia today. Was, do you have that map? Pull that map out. Uh, the, the region of Asia is a, is a, is a, it's just, you know, this is the, this is Paul's second missionary journey. Yeah. Uh, Asia is this area here, uh, right here. It's just an area of, of, of that, uh, that part of the world. Uh, when they came to the border of, of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by uh, Mysia and went down to Troas. So they were ministering. They started here in Antioch. They went to this area of Cilicia. They went to Des uh, Derby and Lystra. Lystra, and then they went into this area here, and then they began to go through here in Bithynia. Some of the prominent areas here, right here in this spot, is a, is a city called Nicaea. Uh, it was prominent in the 4th century because that's where the council of Nicaea was. And then right here in this, this little area here, where there's a little passageway, uh, this is where we find the, the ancient... Uh, town of Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul. And of course it became the city, it became prominent at the time because that was the seat of the Eastern Church, of the Eastern Christian Church. But the text says that they have been prevented from going here, so they went into this area here and went to Troas, which is right here. So that's where they began to minister. And it says that, that this is more of a direct work of the Holy Spirit, of the Lord Jesus Christ, keeping them from going into Asia, I'm, I'm going into Bethlehem, going east, and then it says, I want you to head west. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, let me ask you this. Did you just notice a change in pronouns in the text? He's been saying, he's been using the third person, third, third person plural, them and they. What, what changed in verse verse 10? Someone tell me. We. we and us. You probably joined the ministry now of the, the team of, of Paul and Silas, and he became part of that. And so we, we see Luke, Dr. Luke, now being a part of this. But Paul receives this vision that there is a man from Macedonia. Macedonia is this area here. Uh, where's Macedonia? Right here. This Macedonia. So there's a man. We don't know what it, the text is not saying who this man was. But there was just basically saying right now. He says, come over here. He says, uh, come over to Macedonia and help us. The concept of help or helper in the, in, the, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, normally pertains to God and God's salvation that He provides for people. So always just understand there's this, this, this context of this is not just kind of like help us maybe with food or something. There's this idea of a, of a, of, of a, uh, a, a prayer or of, of, uh, uh, beseeching Paul and his group to come there to bring the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so Luke writes, after Paul had seen the vision, he says, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, would you put that world map there? And I just want to show you all what's going on here. This is the world map today, as, as we know it. Of course, the area that we've been looking at is this little area here. Macedonia is right here in the southern part of what is now Turkey. Okay? They wanted to go east. They wanted to go this way. But the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, prevented them and they went this way. And we know from church history, we know from church history, that the church began to spread in this area and then jump all the way to this area and then down here. And but now it's circum circum uh, what did that circum 
navigate the world all the way to this area of the world. And actually, the work that we're doing, that we're partnering with in Southern Philippines, there is a ethno, what we call an ethno-linguistic pathway from here in Southern Philippines, all the way to Malaysia, Indonesia, all the way up here through India and parts of China, all the way and headed back all the way to Jerusalem, headed back. Now, who designed all of that? It wasn't Paul and them. They wanted to go to, 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 to Asia, they wanted to head east, but the Holy Spirit kept them from doing that. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, it said that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world and the end will come. When we look at the book of Acts, we're not simply looking at, yes, we're looking at history, but we're looking at what the Holy Spirit started. And as I've said to you before, even about what we, the kind of work that, and partnership that we do, what we are seeing around the world and in that part of the world, would you show the 1040 window? This is what we call the 1040 window. The 1040 window is, uh, this is this area of the world numbering over, I think the last number I, I, I looked up was 2.7, 2.8 billion people in the world. They're mostly Muslim, Hindu, and uh, Buddhists. Some of them in China, they don't even have a religion. They, they don't have the gospel. This is, these are what we call the unreached people groups, the UPGs, or uh, least rich people groups. They have a population, these people groups have a, have a Christian population of less than 2%, evangelical population of less than 2%, and there is no active work in those places. O only half a penny of what we collect for missions, for overseas missions, goes to reaching the 2.7, 2.8 billion people in the world. Now, I say all of that to point us back to where what, 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 the, what the, uh, the text is telling us. The Holy Spirit is the one who is directing the work, the gospel work that's going on. Now, you and I are not simply bystanders or spectators to what the Holy Spirit is doing. You and I get to have a part in that. In fact, what are some of the things that we can learn from the text that we just looked at? Number one, let me just give you some four, four different things. Number one. God can use hardships and failures to give us a fresh purpose and fresh start in our, in our lives and ministry. We saw that in, in the sharp disagreement and the parting of ways between Paul and Barnabas. So God can use hardships and even failures in our, in our lives and in our ministry to give us a fresh purpose and a fresh start. Second, we must be culturally sensitive about how to relate to people and be able to share the gospel. Uh, one time when Mark and I were coming back from the Philippines, we you know, I mean, Philippine Airlines, this is a, still with, I mean, he and I have sat with, uh, with Muslims in, in, on the plane. In fact, there was a Muslim guy one time who asked me, he said why he saw that we were, I was actually part of the group, or they were all Caucasians except for me. And I tried to separate myself from them, but it was obvious I was part of the group. And as I sat with this man, he said, why are you a part of this missionary group? I mean, they, they assume if you're white and you're in that part of the world you're doing mission work and so i explained to him why we're, we're doing that but there was you remember this mark when there was a, a on the plane these guys were wearing jesus t-shirts and there were some don't know where who were in those planes and they were just loud well, I, I don't know why but americans have a uh, reputation for being loud and boisterous overseas and and they were just really loud and they were you're going, man, what's what's going on with them? And they're not even cultural sense. They're like, hey, we, you know, we, we, I think we got to meet some of them. And so yeah, we, we went to uh, this one place in, in Mindanao, and, and actually after we left one time, we said their their church was burnt down. And I'm going to just say that out loud. You know, we, we need to be culturally sensitive to people where they are. Third, the Holy Spirit is the one who ultimately guides and leads our gospel work. You know, we make plans, we've got college stuff going on with the international students. Uh, prof has been visiting with ASU about us hosting a welcome to our international students. We've got a Korean mission that's meeting in our church on Sunday nights. Uh, we're doing these outreach things. We're having a cookout at the lake to uh, just mix with people. But listen, we've got to understand 
that you and I can plan all of these things, but it's ultimately the Holy Spirit, it's ultimately God who's doing the work. Which leads us to the fourth thing I want to just leave with you. Sensitivity and obedience to the Holy Spirit are imperatives in our lives. How do we develop sensitivity to the Holy Spirit? Let me, let me tell you this. Discernment in the Holy Spirit. It's not like we've, we've got the spiritual antennas and go, ooh. That, that's not what it is. Discernment and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is developed through us spending time in His Word and we begin to understand the heart, the purpose of God and who He is. And we spend time in prayer and we keep praying and we keep praying and we keep asking God and we just always dependent on Him and we're bathing everything that we do and we, we are in prayer. We pray for our families, we pray for our church, we pray for each other, we pray for lost friends and lost family members, we lost we pray for, for our frontliners who we partner with, we're, we're just praying and constantly immersing ourselves in the understanding of God's heart and His Word. And only then do we become sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because I'm telling you, I've heard over the years, people who tell me, yeah, I, 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 the Holy Spirit told me to leave my family. I had a lady tell me that as I was leaving church one time. I said, because I was talking about, and this is faith, when, when, when Peter got out of that boat, because he trusted the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, more than he trusted what he knew about water. And this lady told me after church was dismissed, she said, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to leave my husband. I'm going to step out of the boat and leave my husband. And I'm going, that is not faith. Because the Word of God clearly says, you do not do that. And how do we master that? How do, we, how do our hearts understand and become sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? If we understand what God says, not only in bits and pieces of the Scriptures, but we begin to understand what He's saying in the fullness of all of the Scriptures, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, this is the heart of God, that people would know who He is, that people would have a heart for Him, because they will know who He is, and they will understand the plan of redemption that He has. Only then, only then, can we become sensitive, discerning about the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But guys, until we do that, until we are very immersed in the Word of God, if we're just, if you're just kind of dipping your toes in the Word of God every morning, yeah, it's, it's a little cold this morning, too, whatever, and you expect God to lead you, how would you know? Paul says in Romans chapter chapter 12 verse 2, stop letting the world squish into its mold. It says, but be changed, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. How is your mind renewed? Through the Word of God. It is not that you can read all the books, but only the Word of God can change your mind and your heart. And then he says, when you do that, he says, then you will know the will of God is good, pleasing, and perfect will. I hate to tell you this. There's no shortcut to it. There's no drive through in spiritual walk with Him. You have to just walk with Him every single day. But take heart because he, that's what He wants you to do. And when you begin to do that, He molds our hearts and He gives us His heart and He opens our eyes to people around us, our families, our friends, our co-workers, who do not know the Lord, and then our hearts, He begins to give us a heart to begin to pray for them. And we pray for them, and He gives us opportunities to share Christ with them. And it's not up to you and me to convince them to get saved, because that's the work of the Holy Spirit, but it's up to us to tell them who Christ is and what He's done for them. The question is, will you be obedient to Him and do that? Respond to Him. Immerse yourself in His Word. Spend time in prayer. Pray for people you know. And ask God to use you in His kingdom work. It's not just in those parts of the world. It's not just in some of the Philippines or Indonesia or Iran or Iraq or any of those places. It's also here in San Angelo. And you have been raised by God for such a time as this. You work where you work. You have family, not by mistake. And you live where you live because God has placed you there. The question is, will you respond to that? Let us pray.